Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel Meyer. I'm the executive director of the historic Ruskin Art Club of Los Angeles. Uh, before we get underway tonight, I thought it appropriate that we remember, that we pause and remember for a moment of silence, the people of Ukraine. Thank you. On behalf of our board of directors, I'd like to welcome you to this special evening, honoring the legacy of America's leading architectural critic, Ada Louise Huxtable. As you all know, John Ruskin, in addition to being a supremely influential 19th century art and social critic, had a profound influence on architectural criticism in his own day and continues to be a presence in architectural debates today, particularly on issues of historical preservation and restoration. We hope to make presentations like this focused on the theme of architecture and in honor of Ada Louise Huxtable's birthday on March 14th, an annual event. In a special way, we'd like to thank Maristella Casciato, the senior curator of architectural collections at the Getty Research Institute for her support and for all her creative input to this evening's conversation. A brief word about the Ruskin Art Club, one of Los Angeles's best kept secrets. Founded in 1888 as a women's art study group, the Ruskin Art Club is LA's oldest cultural association the nexus of art and civic engagement along with advocacy for women's rights was its mission from the earliest days. And the club made signal contributions to the growth of historic Southland cultural and academic institutions, uh, USC, the Southwest Museum, the Museum of History, Science and Art in Exposition Park among others. It was also part of that wildfire movement of reading guilds and societies on both sides of the Atlantic at the turn of the 20th century focused on Ruskin's vision of the integration of art, architecture, economics, and social reform. That comprehensive Ruskinian vision is inspiring new audiences, even new generations today in the 21st century and is perhaps best summarized by Ruskin's famous dictum from modern painters that the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see and tell what it saw in a plain way. Hundreds of people can talk for one who can think, but thousands can think for one who can see. To see clearly, Ruskin writes, is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one." End quote. I think no one can doubt that Ada Louise Huxtable, in addition to all her other gifts, was an exemplar of that greatest gift, the gift of seeing and its corollary, the ability to convey clearly, even as Meredith Clausen has suggested thunderously, <laughs> what one has perceived. Now I'd like to invite our board member, Stuart Denenberg, to say a few words uh, and introduce our conversation. Gabriel. Thank you for this wonderful history of the Ruskin Art Club. I want to talk briefly about my friendship with Ada Louise. I was born and raised north of Boston. And one day years ago, a very close friend, I think of as my sister, called to say that the next time I was on the East Coast, I had to meet her new friend, Ada Louise, who had a summer place in Marblehead and who wrote books about art. Huxtable, I asked. 
Yes, she answered, Ada Louise Huxtable. Sandra, how did you meet Ada Louise Huxtable? We met sailing, she said. But Sandy, you hate being on the water. A moment's pause, and then she realized, oh no, I meant we met, we met garage sailing, yard sailing, we both <laughs> love it. Well, we did indeed meet a few months later and a profound friendship began. Fast forward years later to one of our treasured dinners with her in her New York apartment over a glass of wine, our conversation leading to my exciting recent sale of the archive of Khalil Gibran, author of The Prophet. I have an archive. Do you think it could be worth something? <laughs> Absolutely, let's discuss it. The office was next to the dining room and we soon had our first look in what would become a two year process of inventory, appraisal and review leading to the wonderful acquisition of her extraordinary archive 10 years ago by the far-sighted Getty Research Institute with tremendous work by then curator Wim DeWitt. The purchase included a promise to foster the study of architecture criticism and to create an annual Ada Louise Huxtable lecture, both of which meant a great deal to her. With a certain amount of pride and a great deal of pleasure and wearing one of Garth Huxtable's Brooks Brothers shirts, a gift from Ada Louise, I am personally delighted to introduce tonight's participants in this first annual Ada Louise Huxtable Lecture. Maristella Casciato. Dr. Casciato is an architect and architectural historian and is senior curator of the architectural collections at the Getty Research Institute. In the six years at the GRI, she has curated several exhibitions, including Bauhaus Beginnings in 2019, a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the school's foundation. She has also supervised such major acquisitions as the Frank Geary Papers of 1954 to 1988. From 2012 to 2015, she was Associate Director of Research at the, the Lambert's Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. Her scholarly studies focus on the history and theory of the 20th century, of, of 20th century architecture. And among her forthcoming publications is a facsimile edition of Le Corbusier's Alban Punjab, for which she received a Graham Foundation grant. She will have a conversation with Dr. Meredith Clausen, a professor of architectural history at the University of Washington, where she's taught mainly in the area of 20th century architecture for some 40 years. Over the course of her career, she's addressed a wide variety of subjects, ranging from the Saint-Maritain department store, the first steel frame building to be built in Paris during the first decade of the 20th century, to department stores and shopping centers in general across the nation, as well as the architect Pietro Beluski and the Pan Am now MetLife building in New York, and as well on Craig Elwood and the Pasadena Art Center here in Southern California. Along the way, her work has included books or articles on sacred spaces, women in the architectural profession, Le Corbusier and the emergence of modernism, and most recently on architectural criticism and Ada Louise Huxtable. She is currently teaching one of her regular courses on Paris, architecture and urbanism, as well as writing an article on IMP's Pyramide in the Louvre. Finally, Edward Nelson will join us with the presentation uh, he is an architect in Marblehead, Massachusetts, and was a longtime friend of Ada Louise. He holds the degree of master's in architecture from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, BA in architecture from the Cooper Union, and an MBA from Babson College. His research topics include No Place Like Home, Ada Louise Huxtable's Ranch House as her housing ideal, and Historic Salem. In 2015, Ed initiated the symposium, Mightier Than a, Re Mightier Than a Wrecking Ball, How Ada Louise Huxtable Saved Salem, hosted by the Peabody Essex Museum. Ed contributed a chapter in the recently published book, Urban Modernity in the Contemporary Gulf, regarding his work in Kuwait with the Architects Collaborative. Mm -hmm. He's a former art instructor in architectural history and case studies at Boston Architectural College. Maristella, you have the floor. Hello, good evening. First of all, let me say that I'm extremely pleased to be participating in this event. 
thank you, Gabriel, for introducing the Ruskin Club, but basically for introducing the connection of Ruskin Club and this event and Ada Louise Axtebot. The idea of what you see and how then you express what you see is essential to this conversation. Mm -hmm. I also wish to thank Stuart because I have heard before the way he met with Ada Louise, but the way he told us again makes me thinking that there are there are the there is a ground for a great uh, I mean collaboration between uh, the Ruskin Club, the Board of Trustees, the GRI for making this. Uh, uh, an, an annual event, but also even more than that. Um, it is clear, I guess, to our guests and to our public that we are talking about architecture. Actually, own architecture is the title of one of Ada Louise's many numerous publications. I mean, a recollection of some of her essays for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And we are doing this, as Gabriel remember, um, around the day of her, of her birth, precisely March 14, uh, 101 years ago. Well, in the past three years, uh, I am the senior curator, as you heard, of the architectural collection at the GRI. Um, the, there has been a, a long and wider interest of research projects related to Ada Louise and involving her archives. In, um, in order to remember her birthday a year ago, in, uh, on the occasion of the 100th anniversary, the GRI lecture hall was named Ada Louise. Uh, Axtable Lecture All. And the initiative today is a way to keep going, not only a conversation, but a set of idea projects around her work and the uh, architecture criticism. Few words about the archive. Um, the archive was purchased almost immediately after the, uh, the, the moment when Ada Louise passed away. Um, the, the archive comprises correspondence, typescripts and drafts of her writings, research files, very important, awards and honors, many, advisory committee papers, and then personal papers, and some photographic material. Um, the correspondence oft, often includes prominent architects, but also politicians, scholars, uh, a group of people that uh, unveiled the changing sentiment about architecture over the second half of the 20th century. Accessible writings for newspapers, such as the New York Times, the most well-known, but also the Wall Street Journal and other journals, in, together with books and lectures, provide a comprehensive record of the evolution of her extensive career as architecture critic. The research files, I would say they are also integral part of her writing, but also important as documentation of uh, the way she looks at the changing of the architectural design world around her. Uh, many architects are included, and I'm not going through all the names, I mean, but of course, Norman Foster, Tada Wando, Frank Gehry, Renzo Piano, Richard Meyer, speaking of the um, uh, Getty uh, campus and building. And we know that many of these architects have been also awarded the Prixer Prize, for which Ada Louise served as a member of, of the board for many years, so playing an influential role. Now, the idea tonight, I mean, in a certain way, was to open up the door of this archive with a conversation with Meredith Clausen. Meredith is a very dear friend, besides being a a great colleague, and she has been really researching 
on the, as we heard from her bios, on the scene of post-World War II American architecture for decades. I mean, starting in Paris, now she had really embraced the American architecture. And she has already published several texts um, on Ada Louise Axtable. So I thought we all thought, let's also for another reason that I will um, uh, talk more about at the end of this conversation, let's talk to Meredith, the two of us, two women, two architectural historians about Ada Louise. I have a set of five questions, Meredith, and uh, they include, in, in a way, there are questions where you are one of the actors, and the way you look at Ida Louise, she becomes, I mean, the actor in this conversation. So let me start. Uh, I start from the very beginning, as always. When and on which occasion you started your lengthy research project on Ida Louise? Uh, was she known to you because of her writings uh, for the New York Times? Have you, I mean, maybe you were young enough to read her on the New York Times. <laughs> and I'm really interested in understanding how did you discover her work and her role? And I mean, how did you, this interest, I would say almost a passion on her commitment to architectural critic started? Well, that's an easy question to answer. It's actually, um, you know, my engagement with Hubstable is relatively short-lived. Uh, I came, was, was, you know, as a graduate student, we all heard about her, we may have read essays and so on, but I wasn't really captivated because my focus has always been on the building, the building itself, finding out uh, more about it and, and uh, looking into the design process. So I really was not engaged at all or really only tangentially interested in architectural criticism. How I came across Huxtable and what got me interested was working on Pietro Bielewski. So I, I came across her from the other side, the recipient of her criticism or remarks, uh, her um, basically her remarks. Um, and so I knew of her work through the eyes of an architect who had listened to her. And, and uh, she and Bielewski, I think, I don't think they were close friends. I think there was a great deal of mutual admiration, but whatever it was, I first encountered her in a scholarly way when I was working on the Pan Am building and the book on the Pan Am building in New York, which, uh, you know, as I'm sure you, most of you know, was, is a major force in, in New York City. And she very boldly in 1960, 1960, so well before she was appointed uh, uh, in New York Times architectural critic, the first official one, she um, uh, wrote an article, Marvel, a Marvel or Monster, basically attacking, criticizing the Pan Am building even before it was built. And this is remarkable. First of all, she's a, a little tiny woman, 5'4", standing up against this room full of men who were, you know, twice her size. That's right. And had the temerity to take down and to, you know, size up and take down two of the major modernists at the time, Pietro Belusky and Walter Gropius, who were the designers of the Pan Am building. And it was such a forceful um, um, uh, essay in the New York Times that the public read uh, and hearing her, anyway, uh, hearing, hearing, she was not a, a, a very well-known name at the time, except in the architectural community, but when the public saw this, and this was well before Jane Jacobs, of course, uh, but came out with her book, to my mind, this is what uh, really uh, changed the tide of thinking about modernism 
It was her words. They, everybody, the public could see this building going up in their midst. It blocked off Park Avenue. It introduced 25,000 people per day into an already highly congested uh, area. She pointed out the, the, the problems with it even before it was built. And of course it led to the downfall of these two major modernist figures. Uh, um, Harvard, I mean, uh, Gropius was still uh, head of architecture at Harvard and, and, and Belusky was head of architecture and urban planning at MIT. So it couldn't have been bigger names. And she attacked their building even before it was built. But money speaks loudly in New York as she's the first to point out. And so even when a couple of years after the building was built, the Gila Port went in the building and, and uh, to, much to the horror of people in, in New York, uh, a Gila Port with, uh, that brought in helicopters landing on its, on its roof, uh, you know, starting at eight o'clock in the morning and lasting until the 6 p.m. at night uh, on the hour. And you can imagine the sound of that helicopter reverberating through the, the uh, you know, the, the canyons of New York City, you know, with all the masonry. Um, even that, it, 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 it wasn't until that that the um, uh, heliport, anyway, there was a big accident. And at that point, pe um, the heliport was removed. But nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, the Pan Am building, and now, of course, the MetLife building is still the, voted the, to be the most hated building in New York City. And so one of the yeah, and so that was one that was that was just one introduction to to her work, and then there was yet another one where she put her finger just right on, just right you know just right on the pulse of what was going on in the architectural community. As uh, Marcelli, as you pointed out, she had her she had pulse or your her finger on the pulse, right on the cusp of postmodernism, and she wrote an excellent article on that. So. Well, this is a very good answer, uh, Meredith, and not even very short, but very clear. <laughs> and even with her critique, you went on and wrote a book on the Panam building. So what is the influence of, I mean, how do you see her, uh, I mean, uh, her attack vis-a-vis -vis what you wrote? Oh, a, a powerful voice, an incredibly powerful voice. She spoke to the public. And my, my thesis is, my hypothesis at the time was, and still is, that she really turned the tide or got people thinking about modernism as not necessarily uh, the big, you know, the latest new thing started, th they started thinking critically about modernism. And that's when the seeds on the part of the public, not critics, not architects, not the, archi not the professional architectural com uh, uh, yeah, community, I'm talking about the public. Mm -hmm. And as I say, this was her essay came out a year before Jane Jacobs' book on the death and life of an American great city, which everybody always says, okay, that's when you know modernism really started collapsing. She brought it to the public before that. Anyway, uh, that but that Marcella, that only partially answers your question. That's how I was first introduced to Huxtable and, and became not so much became interested in her, but just had an enormous amount of respect for her and what she had to say and her power, the power of her voice. Okay, well, that's very important. That's what we are discussing, the power of her voice. I mean. Now, you wrote, um, the, let's say, a bio uh, on an entry on Ada Luis for the website Pioneering Women of Arch uh, American Architecture, mm -hmm. created by Mary McLeod and Victoria Rosner for the uh, Beverly Willis Fund, uh, Architecture Foundation. What, when you wrote that text, was that the beginning in your mind of a, a book on Ada Louis contribution, uh, I mean, largely at the American architecture, or no. I mean, contribution <laughs> to the American architecture, or maybe American architecture, it's always too small for her role. Maybe the, the, the true scope of her criticism goes also beyond the American architecture. Oh, to be sure, uh, to be sure. But to answer to your question, to be sure it does, and I can, I can, I can come back and speak to that if you want me to later, but 
to answer your question here, it surprised me greatly when in 2013, and I had to go back and check the date, Mary McLeod, I think it was uh, one of them, got in touch with me and asked if I would uh, would write an essay for the pioneer, for the book that or the archive that they were um, uh, or collection. I'm not even sure what they call it. The pioneering pioneers of American of women in architecture asked if I would write on Huxable. And it shocked me because I hadn't written anything. I hadn't done any research on her. And this is interesting because it told me that there wasn't much out there on her. And sure enough, you look into it and there weren't and nothing would be no major books on her. Uh, her collection of her writings, to be sure. No, you know, we all and everybody knew her name, but no major book on her. Mm -hmm. This was in 2013. And so it wasn't really until well, I wrote the essay. I had a research assistant who helped me amass some material because as I say, I hadn't done anything on her. I was still deeply immersed in Belusky, or at that point, not, not Belusky so much, but um, work in Paris. And I won't, I don't need to go into that right now, but I was deeply immersed in Paris. So the, I, I just got help uh, and wrote that essay. I um, uh, found the subject absolutely marvelous, and, and then in part, that's why I was so engaged in But I didn't really do anything, Maristella, until you contacted me in 2019, and, you know, about the workshop. And I was just, uh, the workshop sponsored by the Getty, and I was just taken aback and, of course, delighted, honored and delighted. And it was really not before, certainly not before that. And it wasn't until a month or so after that workshop, it was in August of 2019, that the idea of writing not on Corbusier and the emergence of modernism in Paris and in the Belle Epoque, but rather Huxtable. And I looked at what the, the notes that I compiled from that workshop and I thought, you know, here's a book just sitting there. And it was, and, and so that was the first time, and I can date it specifically, August 2019, and in the wake of that workshop, which made me realize that I was in such a good position to enlarge upon what I had done before and make it into a book. Well, I mean, this is, that it tells us a lot about how the, the work of the architectural historian develops and how ideas emerge. Now, you mentioned before that she, her voice was very powerful, oh. strong and powerful, especially in all over, all over the US, but specifically I'm thinking about the New York intelligentsia, the New York intellectual environment. There is one figure that we will discuss, maybe even with uh, our friend, uh, friend Ed at the end. What do you think was her rela controversial relationship with Philip Johnson. Oh dear. Well, you, as you know from the notes that I sent you, the questions, that was one of the questions uh, that I have um, uh, that I've, I have engaged in and I'm still acutely, I mean, that's one of the things I'm still working on. One of the things I was doing in that interim between 2013 and you know 2019 was working on Pevsner. Okay. And Pevsner was Jewish. Pevsner had to leave nineteen in twenty, you know, nineteen thirty-three. Uh, it went to land. so I was keenly aware of the problems already. And of course, when uh, uh, you know, I stopped to think about it, and her own Jewishness, and then her own rapport with Philip Johnson. That's when I realized that there's a lot more to it than meets the eye, and that has been published. And then there's, as you, you may, oh, I'm sure you know, the Weber's book on Corbusier, he mentions this, but he doesn't go into it. No. Uh, he doesn't no. explore it at all. And that was one of the, one of the reasons w why I wanted to add, ask Ed about that and whether, you know, how, uh, how deeply uh, she felt about being Jewish. Did it come up much? Was it I have a number of friends who are who are Jewish in background, but are just so completely assimilated they don't think of themselves as Jewish at all. 
somehow I know that she did. And in part, I'm gaining that through the correspondence. She had a very active engagement with Jerusalem, with the mayor of Jerusalem, uh, you know, and um, this is one of the things that I really want to explore in the book. But I've got a long ways to go, long ways to go. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned this because this will be probably part of the conversation of the three of us uh, and during this uh, event. I mean, her um, I mean, relationship with the Jewish community, also the uh, Jewish intellectuals in New York and outside New York. But you mentioned the correspondence. I don't think that many people know that in the summer and fall 2021, so the past one, I mean, past year, you have spent more than three months in the GRI Special Collection Reading Room, working specifically on her correspondence. So, I mean, why, I mean, this is the question. Why the correspondence? You know, oh. many, many scholars look specifically at writing, uh, books, or maybe interested in uh, her role in major, in other um, uh, institution, the Buell Center, the preacher. I want to know specifically why the correspondence by, I mean, you, the choice of an architectural historian, correspond, and what are the great stories, if you can share at least a few with us, specifically discovered in the correspondence? It's a large part of our archive. I sure. Uh, it's what one to, well her correspondence one to uh, uh, what thirteen boxes of the correspondence and I'm going through them page by page. First of all, my my methodological approach there is something I gained in 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 my work on Belusky, just going through his correspondence, all his papers, and the uh, architectural journals at the time, which I found invaluable for going through page by page. Why? Because you get the ads and the advertisements are, are so revealing about the context, ideas, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, with the correspondence, there was absolutely no question to my mind that, they, that uh, Huxtable's correspondence, there was no question in my mind, but that it would be revealing but I had no idea how revealing, and I think I've conveyed this to you before, I'm just every single page is absorbing to me and, and of interest, in part because in my work with Belusky uh, over the course of 40 years, I've learned a lot. And so I recognize the names. Uh, and so a lot of times there, there'll be a note from somebody like Ed, you know, uh, or, you know, somebody else, I'll recognize the name and make the connection. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can, I can do that on the basis. But each, so, okay, you asked specifically, what are some of the stories? L let me just point out some of the things I'm learning as a result of the, the correspondence she both received and um, sent out. First of all, one, one element that I should mention here, Marcel, because I think is relevant, and that is in the wake of the Getty workshop in 2019, uh, or I guess it was the following month or at some point, somebody told me about somebody else working on a biography of, of Huxtable. And I thought, okay, so I don't need to do that. I can, I can go back to Paris. And then I found out a little bit more about her and realized that it, what she was doing was quite different from what I had in mind and that there may be room for two of us. And so I engaged in, you know, continued on. And it was in the course of continuing on that I realized that, uh, that uh, 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 Cipriani is her name, I think. Yes. Uh, I think yes. She she, this was, a, you know, a godsend in many ways, because she would take care of the biographical details, which I was less interested in. What I was interested in was her impact on the built environment, which is enormous. And this, I think, is what is un, has been not brought out yet. And I'm hoping I can, my you know, that I can do it, that I can pull it off, because it's a big, it's a big job. But um most people who have written about Huxtable and I think or who are are 
uh, or who have written, written about her are focusing on her and what she's written and the power of that. What I'm doing is as much as anything, looking at its impact. What, you know, the, uh, and I, of course I was introduced to this via my work on Belusky with uh, Gropius and, and uh, uh, with uh, Le Pan Ambling and see, how, to see directly how their professional careers were affected by her criticism. And then, of course, it was Edward Durrell Stone. And you go back and you look at other architects who started out, shown, and then she writes this article on it. And they're, you know, if not doomed, certainly the building is doomed or tainted. Uh, she has had tremendous power. And so what I was, why I'm so keenly interested in the, in the correspondence is because there you can see what sort of impact she had. You get direct um, uh, uh, feedback from the public. Some people are criticism. By far and away, most of the people who write are in incredible praise of her. They just find her work uh, just, um, you know, I, I can you know, just, it's something that they buy the New York Times to read. It's possible. Mm -hmm. And over and over, I, I almost thought I should bring out one of the articles by the may, then mayor, John Lindsay, uh, applauding her for her work and pointing out how enormous her contribution has been and is or has been to New York City. Um, but this is what I'm tracking. You know, what has, what, what sort of impact did she have on the public? What sort of uh, eyes, you know, what kind of eyes did she open? And that, of course, is one of the key things. Uh, uh, but specifically, I, you know, unless she looked through her correspondence, how do you know about her her connections with the mayor of Jerusalem at a pivotal time? Uh, you know, 1972, 1973. He was writing her regularly. He wanted her input on the master plan of the city. Well, that is that tells you an, an enormous amount right there. Then to uh, all the kind of things that you've been mentioning, her connections with with quality in architecture. How is that measured? Environmental concerns. What was her, uh, you know, she's known in intellectual circles and, and so on, and, and from many perspectives can be seen as an elitist, but at the same time, where was, you know, her interest in the, the uh, uh, slums, the uh, housing for the elderly and the poor, uh, et cetera. You know, it's just very, very wide. She gets the feedback from the public, which you find about only through the correspondence. So th this has been extremely revelatory of uh, not only her personality, but also the 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 network around yeah. her. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, which was probably not only architects, but as I say, politicians, or maybe even people that read the newspaper and for whom those people she had been influential. Now, from what you have said so far, uh, Meredith, I mean interest on the environmental issue, slums. I mean, you mentioned some of those um, uh, components of our everyday life now in the 21st century. Right. So do you see that this increase of interest in other Louise also has to do, I mean, specifically with our current time? I mean, she, can she tell us something of what what we have to look in the coming years, what can still happen, I mean, uh, how much she is, I mean, a, a voice of today, powerful, the same way she was a voice, I mean, in the 60s, 70s, I mean, 80s. Um, do you see this as an important contribution for today? Nope. Can I say that I, without you jaws dropping? I, I, you know, I thought about that question because you you gave it to me before, and I have to say quite honestly, I haven't seen it, and I can tell you why. It's mm -hmm. been because of the past couple of years, our priorities have shifted. Her timing was perfect. She uh, represented in so many ways quality in design, high quality design. How do you discern it? Uh, what can you do to make sure that it's there and that we have it? 
those are not and I'm, I, those are not big concerns right now, at least in the architectural community. And of course, I'm speaking from somebody who teaches in an architecture school. The concern of students right now is certainly not on quality design. It's on use of materials, sustainability. It's on climate change, and increasingly, of course, racial you know racial equity and justice. Mm -hmm. So. And priorities have changed. How long they will remain this way, who's to say? You know, we started out talking about Ukraine. One of the things I wanted to do in my class, and I'm teaching, just finished up a 20th century co uh, a course in American architecture in 20th century um, beyond, what I wanted to do is, is drop everything and hold a seminar in Ukraine, architecture and urbanism and national identity. Can you imagine how, how timely that would be, how much it would reveal of a national identity? Um, but uh, obviously, it isn't, can't do that overnight, but it's the kind of thing that, that uh, to my mind, indicates where values are right now. They will shift again, and I think uh, aesthetics will come back. But right now, uh, I, have, I have found very little, not a lot of I don't want to say not a lot of interest. Everybody knows who Huxable is and everybody has a great deal of regard for her. But I haven't found a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, I'm, and I'm saying that only because I think students in architecture are wanting something else right now, needing something else right now. Probably they need also something else. And it's important that they are aware of the current situation. Right. But, but right. I still, Meredith, I don't think that Ada Louise's voice is only the voice of the past. I mean, it oh, opened, oh, I it opened, agree. Uh, it opened minds, I mean, and, and eyes. So, I mean, it's all, it's always, you know, a kind of cycle that comes back. And also the way we work now in architectural criticism, we look at the critique, it's different from the time when she was to be, sure. to be sure, to be sure. Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. I wouldn't be undertaking this if I didn't find it really, you know, challenging, rewarding and timely, to be sure. Okay. Uh, but the issues, specific issues she brought, she brings up, I'm just I'm reflecting on, on what the demand of students are right now, and I I can assure you that if I were to hold a graduate seminar in architectural criticism, or Huxtable more specifically, I wouldn't get much interest. That's today. That doesn't mean that they're they wouldn't be interested. I suspect they will, and I'm hoping that this book that I, you know, I hope I can pull it off so that it will engage people in in. Uh, in, in uh, what goes into um, architectural design, what makes high quality, why was she so highly respected and admired and still read? Um, these are all uh, things that I think will make it very, very timely, but not right now. No, and no, I, no. I think I'm probably looking, Marcella, at, at the time right now. Yeah, uh, no, no, and uh, you're right. Know. Right now is our conversation, so yeah. that's what yeah. it is. I mean, yeah. I yeah. think it, these are issues that people will, and students, and people, in, people in general, particularly of our generation and older generation, will be actively engaged in. A younger generation, give it six months, give it a year, uh, give, you know, the temper of the times will change. And then I think it will be a, a, a keen. Well, at this point, I mean, Meredith, I mean, first of all, I thank you because your answers were extremely uh, appropriate and very well. <laughs> I know that you have a list of questions uh, that you wish to pose to Ed Nelson. So this gives me the pleasure to pass the <laughs> the voice, the word to Neil at this point uh, to add, and, uh, and maybe some of the question will be raised after our conversation with the three of us as a kind of trio uh, speaking about her impact. That's a very important word and her context. So um, Ed Nielsen, I have the pleasure to give you the screen. It's yours.
Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the Ruskin Art Club for this invitation for hosting this conversation and the Getty Museum and Research Institute for its lecture series in honor of Louise Huxtable. Uh, historian Roger Clauser states, the ranch house can be viewed as an artifact of American society, demonstrating values, ideals, attitudes, living patterns, standards of living, and historical sequences of the society, every bit as much as a pot shard provides information to an archeologist or a bone fragment to a paleontologist. Let's see here. My screen is not responding. Ada Louise Huxtable had outlined and completed research for a book entitled Ranch House before her untimely passing in January 2013. While not a common scholarly topic or one that fits the template of her incisive architectural critiques, the ranch house may be considered not only an extension of the themes of her 2004 book, Frank Lloyd Wright, but also the subject of a house that she lived in for part of each year for three decades. The Wrightian design elements, including the long wall of the principal elevation, the low pitched roof lines contrasted by the vertical chimney, open interiors and glazed wall screens connecting interior and exterior spaces found their reflection in the post-war ranch houses in America. Clausier explained how early literature emphasizes this latter point to an extreme. I quote, this house type is designed so you can't, you can't tell where indoors ends and outdoors begins. As a result, the house seems as big as all outdoors, even though it's a relatively small one. As part of the indoor outdoor theme, early popular literature on the ranch house encouraged the public not only to use the entire lot for living, but also to view the outside areas as room to amplify indoor ones, terrace for living, dining, entertaining, porch for private retreat, kitchen or play yard for utility. Little Louise Huxtable first came to Marblehead, Massachusetts as a child to visit her cousin in the summer, returning as an adult years later for summer vacations. In her last book on architecture, 2008, the last article entitled, No Place Like Home, written in 1979, traces the attributes of the setting she and her husband Garth enjoyed in their seaside summer rental home in Marblehead, where she, quote, restores heart and soul here for another year's go at the great metropolis, unquote. She adds, but chiefly, it is not a house one worries about. It is an easy house that rewards affection and any kind of care. It is full of old things and comfortable things and shabby things objects that have been used and loved or just discarded gently. The cottage by the sea is described as where the living and the style are easy with lessons for architecture. The article concludes with her statement, I think of that house as a single most beautiful thing that I know. Soon, however, the summer reach rental was no longer available. And in 1982, the pleasures of a summer dwelling were transferred, transferred to a nearby house they purchased. Having summered many years in Marblehead, they were aware of the variety of stylistic choices in the local real estate market. First period, Georgian, Federalist, Greek revival, shingle style, and contemporary. The Huxtables settled on a small ranch constructed in 1958. 33 Neptune Road is a one-story, three-bedroom structure of about 1,800 square feet, including an attached garage and screened-in porch that sits on a 6,800 square foot lot. The house is perched on the edge of a hill that slopes quickly down among the trees and neighboring houses to the shoreline of Salem Harbor, about 175 feet away. In addition, because of the slope, it has a walkout half basement in back that provides for a small guest suite of about 500 square feet. Viewed from the street, the house appears as one-story traditional ranch house. 
Upon entering the house at grade, one discovers the site drops off at the rear of the property, looking out into the mid-level of the trees and beyond to Salem Harbor. After purchasing 33 Neptune Road, the, Hus the Huxtables immediately made plans to take advantage of the site's natural attributes, water view, trees, gardens, prevailing breezes, and light. Narrow windows were open to a wider view of Salem Harbor and improved summer cross ventilation. Others changed to become bay windows with built-in seating that looked out to an enclosed garden. In this 1982 drawing by Garth Huxtable, you can see the small L-shaped pool that was added in the basement level yard. These improvements demonstrated the flexibility and practicality of this vernacular middle-class house type. The vertical elevation of the site drops off 18 feet from the front to the back garden, allowing three distinct levels whereby one can circumnavigate the house in an architectural promenade around the property. It becomes evident that each facade relates to its particular purpose. The entry path leads to a calming and closed garden and the perimeter path then explores the sloping terrain and view to Salem Harbor. After Garth's passing in 1989, Ada Louise became aware of zoning problems associated with the fact that the entrance to her house faced onto a private way, requiring her to drive across strips of land of two different owners in order to get to a public way. She had no easement to allow her to do this. As there was much local controversy about this land, she was unsure how it would affect her. Affect her. <clears throat> her lawyer advised that selling the house could be a problem without legal access from a public way. Fortunately, the side of her house opened onto a 20 foot strip along a public way. I first met Ada Louise in the mid 1980s, not long after she and Garth acquired 33 Neptune Road. As a local architect and chairman of the Marblehead Planning Board at the time, I remembered that several years earlier, she had written about development's intrusion into this once sleepy, but now quickly gentrifying town. So I soon began a correspondence with her about planning and development in Marblehead. Years later in 1994, I was asked to provide architectural services to assist in resolving the zoning problem with her ranch house. After studying several alternatives, a request was made and granted from the Zoning Board of Appeals to allow moving the driveway and building a new garage with the zoning setback, within the zoning setback area, but opening out onto the public way. Construction proceeded, uh, proceeded from late autumn 1994 to spring 95. The existing garage was removed and the south wall opened up for new office and large screen porch and a single car garage fronting on a public way. This house has the shortest driveway in Marblehead. It's only four inches at one corner. The floor plan reveals how compact the house is. The dining room is just under 10 feet wide, but not uncomfortable as it opens to the living room and adjacent deck. In the decision to relocate the garage, I posed the question of what to do with the vacated garage space. What was otherwise missing from her house? She replied that a home office was desirable, especially now that internet access was just becoming available. The original garage space was then divided into an enlarged screen porch for visiting guests and friends, an 11 foot eight by 12 foot six home office. Both of these new rooms faced south and introduced increased daylight into the house. In effect, architecturally adding a fourth facade to what was previously an underutilized end of the house. Her daily workstation was placed a few steps from the garden storage workroom and front garden in one direction, and in the other direction, the screen porch and outside deck leading down to the swimming pool where she often swam daily. In the adjacent new garage was Garth and A. Louise's 1979 BMW for short hops around town. Of note to the plan was her decision not to connect the office directly to the house, but to have it separated by an all weather screen porch that one had to traverse through first. The 
screen porch and garage office before and after renovation. A site survey during the town approval process revealed a discrepancy in the location of a fence abutting her neighbor's lot. The rear lot line was actually eight feet longer, which allowed for an extended garden path on the southwest corner. At the same time, clarification of a property owner's rights where a lot abuts an unbuilt paper street added more usable land to a property on the southeast corner. This enabled an expanded garden path along the lot line. At the lowest level, the path explores the hillside plantings, dipping below the wooden pool deck to reappear at the, <clears throat> at the southeast end of the property and winding its way back up through the garden to street level. Huxtables plan their garden to take advantage of existing established vegetation, such as the ancient apple tree and a black cherry tree at the end of the pool. Evergreens such as hemlocks and threadleaf cypress were added for structure, while their favorite pink and white climbing roses provided color. Variegated hostas brightened the shade and cooking herbs and different shades of pink impatience filled the pots near the doors and the pool. The changes in 95 enabled her to remove overgrown shrubs and add a greater variety of plants and flowers. Generally, shrubs and small trees were chosen and installed with the help of garden centers. The Japanese maples, a popular plant at the time, were placed on either side of the front door to draw you to the entrance. But perennials were gleaned from the friends' gardens and landscapers' discards at the town dump. New plants and shrubs were tested, moved, or discarded, but always chosen for their summer and fall qualities of bloom, color, and scent. As Ada Louise often returned to Marblehead in May, early spring bloomers were avoided unless they provided summer or fall interest. Here we follow the path around the, around the right side of the house, down to the rear yard, towards the projecting screen porch and pool, then up the stairs returning to street level. Over the years, there are often minor projects in the works to improve the house, such as replacing the plain concrete steps at the main entrance with lower, more comfortable brick steps with handrails. Campbell's fellow Pulitzer Prize winning critic and friend Robert Campbell wrote after her passing, Ada, quote, Ada Louise lived in two places. She spent half the year in a high-rise apartment on Park Avenue, which was furnished in part with elegant modernist pieces by her late husband, the industrial designer, Garth Huxtable. The other half, including the summer months, she lived in an ordinary, unpretentious, one-story house in the seaside village of Marblehead, Massachusetts, with a view through, the, through trees to the harbor. There was no trace of, quote, architecture, unquote, about the latter. There she worked, cooked, gardened, and entertained guests. Elsewhere, he goes on to add that her house was livable but ordinary, thus fitting right into Marblehead. I think she was secretly proud that it lacked the slightest trace of architectural finery. The rooms are furnished with an eclectic mix with floral patterns bringing the garden theme inside the house. The house included many items from Ada Louise's mother who loved an antique bargain. This was particularly necessary after the death of Ada Louise's father in 1932 when she was 11.
At the far end of the dining room, overlooking the back porch and garden, Ada Louise requested a design for an elongated side table that could also serve as an extension to the rosewood dining table to increase seating from four to six. It is based on a side table garth design in the upper left for a corner of the living room. Ada Louise left to go sailing, not the kind one might imagine in a seaside town, but yard sailing, where with two or three good friends, she would visit the posted yard sales of local residents and pick out the hidden gems their owners thought were good to trade for ready cash. It certainly used her adept powers of visual discernment to separate the wheat from the chaff. When a friend showed her a brightly colored fan she had picked up for a few dollars, Ada Louise informed her it was an original Juan Miro design. Her friend, knowing Ada Louise would appreciate it, gave it to her as a gift. Among her furnishings were valuable antiques, Hitchcock chairs and inlaid chests inherited from her mother, painted rattan from yard sales, porcelain and glass from her mother, more crystal and plates again from yard sales. Her friend and agent Stuart Denneberg captured this idea of an eclectic mix in an excerpt from a poem he wrote in the 2013 Memorial Tribute to Ada Louise. Quote, Fulbright honored, Pulitzer honored, Guggenheim honored, MacArthur honored, honorary doctors filled your closet with gorgeous velvet snoods. But dining with the King of Spain, you love the pin you wore, 50 cents in Marblehead, where, happily less known, you love the garden you now are. Ada Louise believed in the dignity of the environment as a reflection of the dignity of man. And like a garden, it has to be continuously renewed. This is Ada Louise's new office where she sat with her laptop and wrote her articles for the Wall Street Journal. And the screen porch beyond. The screen porch table was another yard sale find that the owner kindly offered to deliver in person. <laughs> and the stair going down to the garden, garden level and the further stair going down to the lower level. Sun sets over the water, changing height and angle of the sun throughout the seasons. With opening vistas, when opening vistas in winter and closing in greenery in summer provided constant change. A. Louise's view of a very special single family environment is recalled in her invitation by Edgar Kaufman Jr. to stay at Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece, Falling Water, just before it was turned over to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy in 1963. She described the magic of the house in a quote by Neil Levine. Quote, this is a house, he writes, about the cumulative effect of stone, water, trees, leaves, mist, clouds, and sky, unquote. Her own house highlights some of these same natural attributes, water views, trees, gardens, prevailing breezes, and light. Campbell's assessment of the house's ordinariness is like the 50 cent pin she wore dining with the King of Spain. She made the ordinary extraordinary. What more useful message could one discover but that the quote, lessons of architecture, unquote, could be found within such modest elements. While Marblehead was her home for half of each year, she was also strongly identified with neighboring Salem, Massachusetts. Huxtable's October 13, 1965 New York Times article decried urban renewal's impact on historic properties in Salem. The article was very influential in helping to expand federal policy to fund, his, to fund not only demolition and new construction, but historic rehabilitation as well. She effectively saved downtown Salem from intrusion by multi-lane highways and the destruction of many historic buildings. 
Both the early summer rental and her later ranch house in Marblehead overlooked Salem Harbor and the city she helped preserve. While initially commonplace, her house is like the plants from the town compost site that Ada Louise rescued and enjoyed. Her renewed interest in research in, on the ranch house and her own environment, her own experimentation with it, with it, brings back into focus a truly American house type that is being rediscovered by an older generation downsizing their homes and by first time buyers looking for a house that expresses openness and adaptability at an affordable price. Whether it be the 50 cent pin, the ranch house type, or the preservation movement, which she championed in Salem and New York City, the message is the same in all three cases and reflected in her advice to quote, love what you have rather than have what you love. The home at 33 Neptune Road, small and compact as it is, fit Ada Louise like a glove. In addition to the personal artifacts, both traditional and modern, it reflects it reflects attributes needed for all housing, efficiency, modest cost, convenience, and access to light, air, and nature. Thank you. Good. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you, Ed. I mean, because uh -huh. this is a way to enter more than any other word in the personality, but also, I mean, the, the sense of domesticity of Eda Louise, but her taste, I mean, many, many way, I mean, to reading her. And this is very unique. I mean, we don't have this in the archive. Um, Meredith, you have any kind of reaction to this oh. environment? Oh, yes. <laughs> Tons. It, it, uh, I, I have a lot in, in, in common with Huxtable, you know, in terms of where we're living, you, you probably can't see it, but a, a house that shares much the same sort of uh, the qualities as hers. It's very interesting to me to see her um, I learned a lot from it, and I'll have to think about it and put it into, you know, words, but just her appreciation of antiques and works on the past, that really tells you a lot, given that she was such an arch modernist. It just tells you a lot, her appreciation both for, for the past and what is is now. I mean, there was so much we didn't get into that we could have, you know, with the ordinary, uh, her love of, uh, and, and, and I think appreciation of, of Venturi and the use of the word uh, ordinary at the time being introduced when it did at that pivotal time, 1970 or so. Anyway, I, I learned a lot. I, and, and so thank you, Ed. I, I would have to add that I, I would have to add that um, uh, this paper it, it was an ex expansion of a paper uh, written thanks to Meredith Clausen yeah. uh, in 2014. It was a conference SAH conference in Austin, Texas, and Meredith chaired the session on Ada Louise a year after her passing. Yeah, this is one of five papers that were presented at that conference. So, so Meredith's connection goes way back, then yeah. further back than 2019, actually. <laughs> And, and 2013 is when I really started. And I think it was in the wake of that yeah, that we, we met. But uh, I still continue to learn a lot about her, her taste, as was pointed out, Maricelli, you pointed that out. But one of the things that I want to underscore, Ed, about what you said was that her, she, really, she really loved cooking and appreciated cooking herself as well as good food and um, uh, gardening. She also really enjoyed gardening and that she brings out in her, you know, it, it comes clear in her correspondence. Her correspondence, Marcella, this answers kind of your question, you know, brings out her, the humanity of her. She was, uh, you know, in close touch with neighbors. There are some letters from you in there that she's kept. 
as well as, of course, uh, Mayor uh, Lindsay and Patrick Moynihan and other people from who were uh, leading figures in the White House on all scales, and she was comfortable with all of them. And they, I think, on all levels, they mattered to her. Mm -hmm. Were precious contacts. Mm -hmm. And one of the what one of the questions that Marcella that I had posed to you that I wanted to ask Ed, and this may not be appropriate, but it may be, and that was her political leanings, because so much of when she started out were, I don't want to say decidedly leftist, but they certainly leaned toward the left, just in terms of their content, her concern for the poor, her concern for uh, what students were doing right now, uh, you know, you're in the 1960s. And then later, her contacts with people like um, Hilton Kramer and Buckley, William Buckley, um, and whether those were indications of her changing political um, mood or whether it was simply her, uh, represent, uh, you know, indicating how open-minded she was to political uh, persuasions of all sorts. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask. I, I, think, it's, I think it's somewhat relative because she was very much against the, the Gulf War, uh, you know, in, in the second Gulf War, that was, uh, very upsetting to her, and I think um, she was um, had an opportunity to receive a, 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 an award uh, from the White House, and she respectfully declined, and uh, uh, because of the government's policy in that. So I think uh, using her position as as critic, as spokesperson, uh, she often used that to express her point of view. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in Salem, um, I was very active in, in the attempt to, to restore or to save a, a mid-century church that um, was unfortunately torn down and, and, uh, uh, and uh, A. Louise had been given a, uh, a special award from Salem for preservation efforts. But when she heard that this church was being torn, mid-century church was being torn down, she wanted to give the, the award back. So it was uh, using her position as a, as a popular uh, critic and outspoken person to advance the causes, whether it be political or preservation. Or social, I would add. She had a very strong sense of social commitment and wrote about this and the architect's responsibility to society at large. She wrote about this at length and, you know, in, in, in different diverse essays and in different ways, different formats, but it certainly becomes clear, which is all the more reason that I'm very interested in exploring more further, you know, more deeply her connection with, um, uh, the, what is it, the new criterion, the conservative um, rag that uh, Hilton Kramer was founded, I think. In any case, I want to track that. I've got a long ways to go, but that uh, consistent with what you've said. Well, we had many uh, we had many dinner parties at our house with her and, and other friends, and uh, she, but politics usually um, didn't uh, didn't uh, yeah. <laughs> overwhelm the conversation. It was that, that, mostly yeah. believe it. It was mostly about architecture and, and the effect that architecture could have on on the, the the average citizen, how it could move people to think a little differently. Uh, yeah. This I get, I've gathered about her uh, that she was extremely diplomatic and uh, was discreet about her own views. She's a very private person, uh, you, you know, and part of the reason why I wanted to ask the questions I did of you because you knew her well as a neighbor. Well, we, we, we were among several people who um, had occasion to ask her, you know, which she had so many interesting stories to tell while well, she went to this Soviet Union when she was on the Times board yeah. and other trips and, and people she's met, would she be, you know, would she be considering a, a biography, autobiography? Uh, but she never wanted to draw attention to herself. She was always right. pointing towards something outside of herself. And uh, I just hope that this uh, paper on her house might be a way of opening up a little bit more information about what her life was like uh, on a more personal level. Can I say something? Uh, yes, Stuart, I, I noticed yeah. you had your yeah. Thank you. Right. 
Well, one of the, I, there's no question in our minds, my wife and I, over these many years of friendship, that she was a progressive in every sense, wow. that in the sense that a progressive will want to save that which is good and great uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, from the point of view of a certain cultural taste, if you will, in the kitchen, there were on the wall saved two menus from a Rothschild dinner that she had attended oh, yeah. in a very grand way. Oh. And so it, it wasn't, you could be a progressive, but also have champagne taste. To be sure. She did have champagne taste. And Meredith, I wanted to ask you in the course of your looking into the correspondence so thoroughly, did you happen to come across that wonderful letter that sticks in my mind among many, many others, but one in particular that was not written to Ada Louise, but about her to the editor of the New York Times when she first appeared in print from Frank Lloyd Wright, who said to the editor, you really have to watch that girl, she's terrific. <laughs> Did you come across that one? Have you seen that one? It's in there, it's in there. Well, I, wait, 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 I would have yeah. seen it. You I, would have? Yeah, well, oh, that would have, wait, wait, wait. You said that it was written by Frank Lloyd Wright? That's correct, on his oh, I tell you, you can go back and check on this, but I went through the, I mean, the extremely small oh. file. Yeah. Of, no, no. It's, yep, and he says to the editor of the New York Times, yeah. watch, for, watch that girl, she's going to be something, she's terrific, mm -hmm. yeah. So that would have been what, about 1957? Um, yeah, after the Museum of Modern Art and then their very yeah. first year at the Times. Probably, probably Stuart, it's those letters are not specifically in the folder of correspondence. That makes sense. And I mean, in terms of how the archive yeah. is organized, yeah. I mean, and the archivist um, uh, way of working. So um, I'm sure it is there, but uh, Meredith, next time you come, we need to look at the, uh, beyond the correspondence, there are other letters. I mean, definitely. Oh, so they're not all, all the letters no. are not in correspondence. Okay. No. <laughs> because I. This is not a correspondence, Ada Louise correspondence. Right. It's a right. letter from right. Frank Lloyd Wright to the New York Times. So, right. you know, and it's even earlier than the, the time she was completely, right. I mean, part of the staff. No. No. So they are cataloged in a different way. Right. <laughs> so no. this. Hmm. Those are those are the, the the many aspects of an archive that you really need time to dig into. I mean, deeply before everything of those surprises are racing to the surface. <laughs> Maristella, uh, we're getting some questions in the chat. So, oh, is yes. this a good time to open it up a little bit? Yes, yes of Gabriel. And also for the Q and A, I mean, right. please open up. <laughs> Ga Very Gabriel, good I have a question. Yeah. Okay. My name is Jim. I'm in Geneva, New York. It's not exactly the mm -hmm. architectural capital of the world, but um, it's it's a lovely place, and we have a full moon tonight over one of the Finger Lakes. But that's not my point. I wanted to ask our wonderful uh, uh, scholars. Um, did a, since this is the Ruskin Art Club lecture, did Ada Louise read Ruskin? I hope she did. If she did, what did she think of him? And do you think that Ruskin's thought influenced the way she approached architecture? Hmm. Well, I can I can say I, I don't know of any connection that she had specifically on Ruskin, though I'm quite sure she read him because she was extremely well versed <clears throat> in architectural history, and she worked with. Uh, Hux, uh, Hitchcock, who was highly respected. So uh, nothing, I haven't run across anything directly myself. And you may know. I haven't heard of that. Yeah. No. First, well, well I, uh, just a, a point, uh, Jim. I, I did do a little bit of just very, very superficial, uh, you know, internet search of uh, Huxtable and Ruskin. Uh, it, it would appear that she refers to him uh, more or less in passing, but yeah. certainly as a kind of source. For example, there's a quote, uh, which I don't have, uh, where she talks about uh, uh, her concern for what was happening okay. architecturally in Venice. The, uh, and then the, she uh, calls to mind Ruskin's uh, involvement 
you know, with with Venice. Uh, so there, there, you know, there seem to be these kind of not not uh, fulsome uh, references, but but uh, you know, the uh, re references to Ruskin as an architectural scholar and critic would uh, just in the course right. of things. Right. Well, well, Ruskin's Ruskin's great book, The Seven Lamps of Architecture, appeared in 1849. So it's almost 170 years old. And um, so I guess I'm, it made an enormous splash at the time. Ruskin was deeply disliked by the architects of his time because he tried to tell them exactly what they were doing wrong. They didn't like that. And uh, so uh, since he influenced so many people of his own time, I'm just wondering whether in this book and then in the great three volume masterpiece, The Stones of Venice, whether that had any effect on Ada Louisa's development as a thinker on matters architectural. Well, as I said before, it doesn't, you know, I, it, what just came out about her quoting Ruskin from time to time makes sense. In answer to your question about whether he, Ruskin himself, had a big influence on her architectural criticism, I think not. I think not Thank you. Or other other uh, other um, forces that were far stronger. But of course she knew of his work. There's no question about that. Thank you. There were a couple of questions, I think Gray and uh, Gray Brechen and uh, Brecken and uh, Ted uh, Bosley had questions about uh, uh, Ada Louise Huxtable and Lewis Mumford, whether there was any a connection oh. there. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Meredith. Oh, yeah. I know there. Uh, uh, you know, I again. I can, I'm just getting started on this. I've got a long way to go, so I can't put my finger on any one. You know, uh, document or or essay that she wrote on. But I'm sure that she had connections with him. She had. Um, and you know, great respect for him. She refers to him a lot and quotes him a lot and refers to his writings a lot. Uh, but mostly it was a sympathy, you know, sympathetic minds as much as anything, but a, a very close connection. Uh, and I'm, I'll leave it at that because I don't know of anything specific. And Meredith, and Meredith, yeah. I mean, you know that Mumford anyway was, um, uh, sorry. sorry. I, um, Mumford was already in the 30s and 40s, I mean, uh, for the New Yorker writing. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. As, I don't want to say the architecture critic, I mean, because it was a different format, but his voice was extremely important. Be sure. And, uh, and for, in the New Yorker. And in a certain way, I mean, I'm not a scholar here, I mean, I'm not a, the expert. But I would say that in a certain way, when Mumford completed his, I mean, or left the New Yorker, and then Ada Louise had such a long time, I mean, long time, short, but very important time at the New at the MoMA and working specifically with Hitchcock. I mean, this became in a certain way her apprenticeship. I mean, and then it's when the more and more the New York Times becomes for her the reference and then she starts her career. In a certain way, I see those aspects, Mumford, Hitchcock and MoMA, and then the New York Times very much related. Though oh. I never read, and I, I think those are many, some of the many topics that still have to be discovered, discussed and De developed in uh, in uh, scholarly research. I mean, yeah, I think she looked at, at Louis Mumford as a model. Yes, of, you know, and and she she was somebody that she greatly admired, and was a model. You know, yes. she uh, his rapport, his reaching out to the public that spoke to her far more so than Hitchcock. Hitchcock yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. 
Hitchcock, she admired greatly for his, I think his eye. I think she gained a lot from his, his eye um, and seeing. And so she learned a lot from him, but he, he was also quite an elitist and she was very much aware of that. And his audience was very specifically the architectural community. She wanted the broader public. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Lewis Mumford there who provided that model. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. Stuart, you are great. Yeah, so. Yeah, so just this smallest anecdote, and I'm trying to remember if, I, if I'm trying to hope that I remember it correctly. It was either Mumford or Pevsner in a group of uh, architects who were uh, critics who were, who were together. And one of them, one of the two of them was perfectly silent during this entire very animated conversation about a major issue. And then suddenly, it was either Pevsner or, or, or Mumford who made a, a short sentence that captured everything. And Ada Louise said this was so impressive that yeah. he would remain silent during, for, for minutes on end, if not a half an hour, and then he would have been listening to every single word, every nuance mm -hmm. of the argument, and then he would come in and devastate everybody with mm -hmm. his, his insight. Mm -hmm. Who would that my, sound my like? Guess. Mumford or Pevsner? I would have said it could have been either. Yeah. Uh, uh, radically different though they were. Radically different, their voices, their, their <clears throat> could have been either one. <clears throat> Stuart, I think you might be referring to the, um, the, the MoMA symposium in February of 1948. Uh, and Ada Louise Huxable would have been a curatorial assistant at MoMA at that time, and I, I hope and I expect that she was in the room when that happened, uh, but all the luminaries were there, Hitchcock, Philip Johnson, Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and Lewis Mumford was um, uh, moderator of that, uh, of that symposium. And so I'm guessing that might be what you're referring to. It was, was Pevsner there? Uh, not to my knowledge. Yeah, see, I don't, I, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't think so. I would be surprised that Pesner in 48 was in, in, in the US, I mean, coming for the symposium, but Mumford, I mean, it, it was obviously there now that you say was the moderator. That's a great source. I mean, it's worth looking into that again. Mm -hmm. There are other questions, uh, um, yeah. Gabriel. R Ryan Berkeley. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Yes, Ryan, are you still with us? I'm here. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I was, um, I'm a Philadelphian, born and bred, and I'm interested in the work of Bob Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, I, I've met them on more than one occasions and I admire their work. And it seems to me that in, I, I, I have to confess, I, I haven't read a lot of Huxtable's criticisms of their, their writing or, or buildings. So I'm kind of curious how they may have influenced one another. Meredith, there is a great correspondence. <laughs> a big, a big, big question. You know, um, I, I think she had respect, a great deal of respect for both um, Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, but she also did not see eye to eye with them architecturally. Uh, I'm, this is all tentative because that is just one great big uh, yeah. um uh, um, um, topic that I am eager to get into because I'm particularly interested in that pivotal moment. I've written on it, uh, on, on Graves Building in, in Portland, which has now become so iconic, but it, it was in, in working on uh, Michael Graves' Portland Building and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the beginnings of postmodernism that I encountered this second essay of Huxtable's um, the Troubled State of Modern Architecture, written in, in 1980. And she wrote it for the uh, Daedalus, for the Academy of Arts and Sciences. And it was picked up immediately by the architectural community and republished a couple months later in Architectural Record. And there you can see her, her um, angoise, 
her her mental torment you know she just uh, it was troubled and so I, that's part of what I want to say, you know, sort out and get into that pivotal moment in architectural, in the architectural history, but also architecture of the of uh, the U.S. of A. of American art. It was a turning point, and she had her, uh, Marcella. I said this to you before. She had her finger on the pulse, and she could tell things were in a state of upheaval. Mm -hmm. That that only sort of answers your question, but if you want, I can send you a PDF of that essay, and you can see what she's beginning to to uh, 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 beginning to feel about Venturi's work. She recognized somehow that it was terribly important, and yet it was really tough for her to come to grips with it. Yeah, that's, no, Meredith. I, that. I mean, she was part of the committee for the Prix surprise, I mean, oh. to uh, Bob Venturi. And mm -hmm. she was in London, I mean, uh, yeah. so, I mean that's the reason. And there is also some correspondence. So to, to un not to answer, but to, uh, to talk to Ryan, I mean, th there are, of course, I mean, not only a lot of respect, but they are looking to each other mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. in a very close way. Also, because in the terms of what kind of intellectuals they are, specifically right, exactly. Bob, the early Bob, Robert yeah. Venturi, more than Denise, I mean, she can respond to some of their uh, questions. And only, also the early, the early writing of Denise, I mean, when she was both in Rome, in the UK, uh, very early, there are some interesting issues related to social architecture, social issues. So she knows that they resonate in her mind. But I agree with uh, Meredith that the, the, become, the, being of, the becoming of postmodernism was extremely troubling for her in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one of the questions that I posed in numerous proposals that I've had, you know, how, how mentally, one of the issues that I'm, I'm grappling with, how, how did she change her criteria for what constitutes quality in design, given the, the fundamental shift from modernism to postmodernism? Mm -hmm. She was, um, um, I mean that's one of the one of the questions that I'm grappling with, and I hope to get into. But it comes down to what we were talking about before, and that is architectural criticism. Uh, what do you do when you are, uh, you know, your you are valued for your taste, your um, your sense of what is quality in architecture, and then all of a sudden, all those criteria are you know, the rugs are pulled out from underneath you, underneath you. How can she, you know, evaluate quality in a postmodernist building? I don't think she could, at least initially. And we have to bear in mind that her mind was open and changed. And so when I mentioned the date of that, that essay in 1980, that's very different from the date that, that, that Venturi was given the Princeton Prize. One other thing I wanted to point out is, <clears throat> again, kind of revealing about her correspondence. She was a close friend of the Pritzkers, as well as <clears throat> the editor uh, yeah, of New York Times. She was close friends. And one of the questions that I've had is to, to what extent did that affect her, um, her convictions? You know, being close friend, particularly with the the Pritzkers, a, a friend, a very deep personal, social, you know, at, but personal uh, relationship with them. How did that color things? If it did, I'm, I don't think. Am I muted? Oh, no, you're on. No, you're on, Beverly. No, no. <laughs> I don't. No, you are not. She she was pretty objective about things. She she was not a terribly. I mean, she really tried not to be biased, and she really wrote about the relevancy of yesterday's today. Wow. And there is actually nobody that would not talk to her. And she even sa said wow. that because her last essay about the New York Public Library, the only person who would not talk to her was the director of the New York Public Library 
who was against, you know, didn't, I mean, she saved the library because of the way it was built. And uh, he was the only person in her whole career that would not talk to her. But I, th I think some of this, the relevancy that, that you're talking about in who she was is something that we're seeing pervasively today. And I, I think she did try, I mean, she did talk about overpopulation and how buildings were built to push people down onto the streets. And the, some of the issues that were coming up because of, um, as times were changing. But I think that the irrelevancy that we're seeing today and the problems with diversity and a lot of these issues that you brought up, Meredith, are, are things that are, are not, weren't just her problems. I think there are problems in, in a generational change and, and it yeah. is a watershed moment that um, so much is being reevaluated. And you, you have a touchstone in talking to the next generation which is an appreciated uh, perspective. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I would like to do before we end tonight is to thank the three of you for wonderful presentations. I've learned a lot. I want to reprise or rephrase my question earlier about Ruskin. Um, and my question to you three modern, modern architectural critics is, is this, what influence, if any, and I think the answer is probably very little. Um, do you think that Ruskin has on modern architectural thinking and theory? Hmm. Well, can I? Yeah. Just, he, he, uh, his name. If I'm I'm being frank here, I'm and it's straightforward. His name never comes up in in uh, courses on architectural theory and design and uh, history design and theory now, and I can substantiate that by showing you syllabi. It's just never he is not mentioned. He, he's mentioned and brought up and and perhaps discussed in art history, but. I'm in architectural history, in architectural history, which are mainly service courses for architecture schools. He, uh, Ruskin is not, not, uh, not actively read, but you've got to bear in mind that students right now are not that much interested in history. I think they will be in, in due time, but right now they're really just not. Thank and, you. Well thank, well, thank you, I mean, Dad. I, I want to say, I mean, I don't want to uh, merit it. I understand that the role of history now becomes, I mean, more complex in architecture, oh, yeah. teaching and pedagogy and so on. But still, I mean, let's think that history is a way to, to learn how to, to see it as well. I mean, I mean, it's not the tool. It's not the tool, the direct tool. But I agree with you that, Ruskin, it's often referenced, but as a second secondary reference, not the first direct reference, you know? And that's the point <laughs> that more and more in syllabi, you read, I mean, you have to read from page one to 51 of something, and, and maybe there is a passage of Ruskin, but he is not the first reference. I mean, that's the point. I mean, it's because history, it's more, I mean, more, rather than complex, it's it's layered, and then you have to go into the layer to find right. Ruskin as well. I mean, mm -hmm. this this would be a contrast, I think, to to early twentieth century architects, even to yeah. Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright, who would uh, for whom Ruskin was a source in yeah. in a variety of ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely, but, yes. Yeah. But when you when you when you bring up theory, the theory that students, if they're um, five years ago, the, the the students were deeply immersed in theory, but it was Jacques Derrida, and it was right, Foucault, right, right. and it was right. modern contemporary uh, French intellectual literary theory, not nineteenth century theory, or not uh, uh, the the, the Mulgrave book. Um, Maricela, you probably know that because it yeah. was part of the, I mean, the, the, the GRI essay. Yeah, yeah. The reason. Ruskin, if it, 
if he's in there, and I don't remember if he is, he may have been included. I know the Viola de Duke and other 19th century people were, but, but that's not what seems read. The only 19th century figure that I know of that is being read by people interested in theory, and this is in our architecture school up, up here, and so I'm speaking about one, was Semper, the German, you know, the German <laughs> theory of uh, Semper. Uh, but other than that, and occasionally Viola Le Duc, very little with the, from the 19th century. But I'm saying students are have have um, are no longer interested in history or theory. And there was a big wave of of theory, but that is as at least up in our architecture school. And I'm speaking only for this one. I'm sure they they differ. Ruskin, I think if he comes up in arc and is, is discussed, uh, likely he's going to be discussed in architectural drawing and painting, watercolors. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong on that, but. Mm -hmm. yeah, One of the areas where he does come up today is in the, in the whole discussion of historical preservation, since that yeah. kind of came out of the Ruskin circle and Ruskin's you know, uh, views about restoration. Uh, yes. Namely, don't do it. Um, and, <laughs> his, right, and his whole concept of uh -huh. the, 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 the march of time as it marches across a living space and the various changes are part of its identity versus the, the attempt to get back to a pristine, a so-called pristine uh, past. So that's been influential, I think, still in some circles. I know, I mean, Meredith, we still have, I mean, I think uh, authors of the early, also writers, architects and writers, and I'm thinking of Van de Velde, I mean, some of them, I mean, the GRI publication is going back to one of the Van de Velde books and the presentation, I mean, in English and translation into English. Van de Velde is another author that it's not much known in this country. I mean, incredibly, I mean, while it's known in, in the French literature, Italian and so on. So, I mean, it, 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 it also, Ruskin, I mean, it probably, it's the, the bottom line of very much the discussion in architecture in the early mm -hmm. 20th century, as you said, uh, I mm -hmm. mean, Gabriel. Certainly, I would think that sustainability would be uh, a common a common thread. But getting back to Ada Louise, what impressed me so much about her was that her, her mind, she was so open that you could not predict what she would say. Uh, you know, many theorists they have a very specific uh, point of view or policy that is almost predictable. But in, with with Ada Louise, the uh, her discernment was so sharp that it uh, it defied you know prediction. It, uh, uh, and and what, whatever she came up with was was said in a in a wonderful, gentle way. So, uh, I am. Meredith, you are looking to a book. I'm looking at the the Mulgrave book I just mentioned. Oh. Yeah. And of course, Ruskin is cited a lot in the index, but no essay on him specifically. Mm -hmm. And that was just obviously a cursory glance, but I didn't see it, which is which is telling. But I also remember acutely uh, one of the chairs of the architecture department in late 80s, 1990s, who loved drawing and painting. And he... Um, <laughs> Uh, Ruskin would have figured into his watercolor class in architecture. That's gone with CAD. That's completely gone. It's no longer taught mm -hmm. for what that's worth. That doesn't mean it won't come back. As I said before, I think, I think the interest in history will come back. Uh, I think the interest in drawing and, and architectural drawings and perspectives will come back, renderings, beautiful ones will come back, but there isn't much interest in it in our school. And I'm emphasizing that schools differ, of course. Yes. And also country differs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah to be sure, absolutely. 
Gabriel, do you have an, any other question you want to raise? I think that's it. I think we, we're going to need to wrap up, I think. Yeah. As it's always my sad task. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to close conversations, but hopefully this will this will carry on. Um, I'd especially like to thank Maristella Cachato and Meredith Clausen and Ed Nilsson for a such a rich, informative and multi-layered, such a layered uh, conversation. Uh, to Stuart and Beverly Denenberg for championing this event and oh, to our yeah. own Katrina Lau, who has gone back to her studies uh, for her all of her technical uh, help tonight. Uh, please join us for our next event, Thursday, March 31st, 5 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, this will be a, a kind of virtual field trip uh, called Book Art, an evening with leading bookbinder, restorer, and book artist, Charlene Matthews. I can't resist reading a little piece from the LA Magazine about her some years ago. Quote, using materials as unusual as Victorian ceiling tile, kangaroo leather, and a fish eye lens, the one woman show that is Charlene Matthews Bindery outfits books in a cramped studio sandwiched between a restaurant and a florist. A blur of vivid hair in an electric blue studio Matthews flits among her 19th century binding tools, which include a huge press, a paper cutting guillotine and job backers, steel leviathans that grip and cut. In her restoration work, she cloaks hardboard covers in vintage silk, ribbon and leather finished so finely they look translucent." Ooh. End quote. So Matthews, a legendary teacher of book binding crafts, a book oh. designer, for major artists and a book artist herself, will take us on a virtual tour of her world, her many faceted world, and offer us also in the bargain, a unique, a unique tutorial on the care and maintenance of books in our own libraries. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. So join us for this virtual field trip. Uh, details about this and our ongoing season of lectures and events will be found on the website www.ruskinartclub.org. Please take time, I always urge people to browse the website. Um, it has information about the history of the club, of, about John Ruskin, resources for Ruskin studies, links to other Ruskin oriented organizations around the world, membership applications, and of course, our YouTube channel on which you will find posted all our lectures and events. This conversation will be up on YouTube shortly. Oh. So when you ask access the channel, please consider subscribing. Um, it seems to make YouTube happy for some reason. So listen, thank you all for coming. See you next at the Bindery oh, and good great. night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, man. Oh. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, and I mean, everybody for yeah. this in incredible Wonderful. And very open-minded, I mean, <laughs> uh, conversation. Thank that you. Was wonderful, Thank wonderful, you. Maristella. Thank, Thank you, Meredith, so much. Oh, you're more than welcome. It was good. You've opened up a lot of doors. Yeah. 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 Well, this conversation day. opened up a lot of doors. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Buona Maristella. Tante grazie. Lei è molto gentile. Grazie. <laughs> Arrivederci. Yeah. Great, great, great. Ciao. Bye. Oh, Norman Weiss. Oh, he's here. Okay. Norman, good to see you. And Stuart, I'm glad to meet you, even virtually only. I hope look forward to meeting with you again. He may Norman, have great to see you. Good to see you. And Alan Hess, it's great to see you. This is Eric Jessen in Laguna Beach. He's left, probably. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Meredith, are you still listening? Are you still on there? Who? Uh, I'm talking to you. I'm, I teach at Columbia, and I'm uh, delighted and unhappy to say that I spent much of the day today in a curriculum.